I know I'm standing here tonight because 53 years ago, my three-year-old son invited me to go to a, a Sunday school class with him. Back in 1957, I was living in Monrovia, California. I didn't grow up in the church. I didn't grow up in a religious environment. My people was bootleggers and gamblers. Uh, I didn't know anything about uh, religion. In fact, I had grew up in Mississippi and, and I would see these big signs that would say, in the big white churches, would say, religion today, everybody welcome. If I'd have went there, it'd have been a riot. So everybody didn't mean everybody. I'd go to the black congregation and I would hear them talk about some dead people and they would shout, but they would go back out and accept all of the oppression. It had very little to do with changing people's lives. My son invited me to this little Sunday school. And there for the first time in my life, I came under the influence of the Word of God. There was a verse of scripture that struck a chord in my life. I think it's basic to what it means to be a Christian. Paul, they were studying the life of the Apostle Paul, and Paul was explaining his own motivation, his own behavior in the book of Galatians. And I came to that passage, and that passage of Scripture spoke to my deepest longing in life. See, I grew up without a mother. I grew up without a father. I grew up without the institution of love. That's a family. And so I think that was my greatest desire, to be loved. And I heard Paul explain his activity, his motivation for what he was doing. He said, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, he said, but Christ lived in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, he said, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He loved me. I realized that really I didn't understand that love. And if there was a God in heaven that loved me enough to send his only begotten son into the world to die for me, I wanted to know that God. And the best way I knew how that morning, I asked this God to come into my life. He changed my life. I discovered that I was loved by a holy God. Now that's the burden of the message. That's the burden of the incarnation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's central. It's about God's love. It's not that we love God, but that he loved us. And becoming a Christian is discovering that and trying to love that God back and love him in gratitude for him giving himself for us. Then the second thing happened to me, I was discipled. I think we short circle uh, the whole idea of what it means to be Christian by saying we are Christian, but never be discipled. I was fortunate to be a disciple. And I was discipled around two basic passages of Scripture in the Bible that have set the course of my life. That first one was the last words of Jesus before he left. After his incarnation and all of that, it's Acts 1-8. It's that passage. And they asked him about when he returned, was he going to restore the power to Israel, the political, social power, economic power of Israel. And he said, it's not for you to know the time of the season. What they were really wanting to share that power, they were wanting power. They were wanting enough power that they could change the society, change the world. 
He said, it's not for you to know the time and the season. He said, but it's power that you need. You will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and in the othermost parts of the world. This old man who discipled me helped me to understand that it was my work and it was the work of the church to become a steward of this wonderful love and to share this love with all the world. And the mission of the mission of the church is to share this transforming love of God to the world. That's our work. That's our stewardship. We have a message to tell to the nation. We have a gospel that burns through racial, culture, and economic barriers. Paul could say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God. What we have happened to us, we have taken this wonderful gospel, this love of God, and we have buried it into our culture, and we have become captive to culture in our society. And then we have taken on a few political issues, and now we define Christianity based on those political issues. We need to define Christianity based on the fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and that he's alive and he wants to live his life out in us. Christianity is the outliving of the in-living Christ. Christ is not dead. He's alive. And he wants to live that life out in us here on earth. That's what the incarnation is all about on earth. And so he discipled me around that. And then the third passage that he deciphered me around was, how do you do that? How do you do that? That's the mission. Most people think the mission is primarily to keep them out of hell and going to heaven. When Philip talked like that to Jesus, he rebuked that. He said, um, you want to get to heaven? He said, I am the way to heaven. I am the truth about God. I am the life of God. No one comes unto the Father but by me. If we get to heaven, it will not be by our good works. It will be because Jesus himself has gone on before us, and he has prepared a place for us. And he said, I will come again and receive you unto myself. We are left here on earth to carry out the mission that Jesus came to share here on earth, to rescue the perishing and to care for the dying and to care for them in society. What was the, the third one? The second Timothy 2.2. 2. This is the method. I believe it's inherited in the Great Commission. I believe that was the commission for developing of the local church was to raise up indigenous leadership from the community to carry on God's work here on earth. That was the church. The apostle Paul heard that message. He saw that message lived out at Antioch. And he, kept, he saw the gospel tribe at Antioch. They call them Christian furs at Antioch. Why did they call them Christian furs? They didn't call them Christian until 15 or so years after the, what we call the church had began. They called them Christian furs at Antioch because the Bible say in that 13th ch chapter of the book of Acts, it says there was people in Antioch leaders and bishops and deacons. And each one of those represented a different racial or ethnic group. And they were serving God with equality. God had worked this out. The Bible said if anyone be in Christ, they are new creatures, the old has gone and the new has come and all of this. You see what has happened to us? We have accommodated racism and bigotry within the church. We have become captive to it, to our culture. We have a story to tell to the nation. 
as we celebrate our 21st year, I want to just almost close with this. I'm, what we've got to do and what young folks are looking for, they want to see Christ lived out here on earth. And what they are hearing is our issues, abortion, homosexuality, a politica, and all those things. Those things are very, very important. But the church should be defined by this may all people know that you are my disciples is because of the love we have one for another. And that we are reaching out. And that our whole idea, and I wanted to make this clear, the church is not built on us as human personality. I think we have overshot personality. I think our Christianity is being defined by these personalities. Our Christianity should be defined by the outliving of Christ's life and Christ living his life out through us. And the world can know that we are Christian because of the love we have one for that. That is the message. And so I'm closing with this. As we celebrate this year, I want us to understand that my idea and our idea of the Christian of CCDA was to build or to release people, black, white, all races, from their culture captivity and that they carry out this great commission. He said we was to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every ethnic group. I think the problem is that instead of us building our house on this solid foundation, which is Christ, we are building our movement around what is the popular issue of the day. And we are being defined by that. And we are not seeing the impact. And there's a young generation that's emerging who are not as racist and bigot as we were. These people need a clear call of the gospel. They need to hear what I heard 53 years ago, that is Christ living his life out in us. And so, the rest of my life, several things I want to do with the remainder of my life. I really want to try to take the word of God and put it into environments where children, I'm really committed to trying to get the Word of God into the hands of children, into the hands of families, that they can read that Word of God to their children, and they can be moved like my three-year-old son would move to invite me to come to the church, because right today, the media, the iPod, and all of this is pushing out and filling our children's ears with Noah's. And somehow or another, we have got to bring that word of God there. I believe it was all my heart. I believe that Hebrews is right. The word of God is living. It is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces to the vital of sin of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So the rest of my life, if I could sing, I would sing this right now. And I hope this can be CC Day as we go forward. My hope is built on nothing less but Jesus Christ and his righteousness. I dare not trust any other frame but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground, all, all other ground is sinking sand. I don't care what's the political issue or the association. We can deal with those. But we got to make sure that our, we are anchored beneath the veil, that we are anchored on Christ, the solid rock. All 
all, all of the ground is sinking sand. 